if it says we're live, so here we are. Ooh, seven, seven, seven. Yeah, seven, seven, seven. It's our airplane episode. We're also jackpot, right? Jackpot. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> I looked on the internet to find out what 777 means. And apparently, uh -huh. apparently, 777 is when you're like perfectly in tune with the universe and your life oh. is about to make a big breakthrough. So we are episode 777 of Twist and we're so about to make a breakthrough. I don't know to what, but anyway. <laughs> For those of you who are starting the show with us right now, this is a science program, and we are recording live right here and now. What you see in the next hour or so is our live broadcast. All mistakes and other things may or may not be edited out for the podcast. Might happen, might not. But if you want the pretty edited version, subscribe to our podcast. Look for This Week in Science. Okay. Are we ready to start the show? We're ready. Okay. Let's start this show in three, two. This is Twist. This Week in Science episode number 777 recorded on Wednesday, June 10th, 2020. Science takes flight. I'm Dr. Kiki, and today on Twist, we will fill your head with artificial sleep, ancient hormones, and butterfly wings. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. In the aftermath of a public lynching on the streets of Minneapolis, as peaceful protesters across America have been met with violent writers, rioters uh, dressed as police... His calls go out to defund, reduce, and even replace traditional policing with something that better serves the needs of communities. Following our programming is about science. Public policy is not our wheelhouse. We will remain focused on the expanding knowledge of people who are pursuing ways to improve society, to prolong human life. And wherever those pursuits take us, we'll be here to talk about it. Here on This Week in Science... Coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know what's happening. to you kiki and blair and a good science to you too justin blair and everyone out there welcome to another episode of this week in science we're back again to as justin said talk about the science that's right we're going to talk about science today mm -hmm. thank you for joining us so much we have a fantastic show ahead all sorts of stories as we jump into them, though, one of the big stories of the day is the shutdown STEM movement. If you go online, hashtag shutdown academia, shutdown STEM is a movement related to the Black Lives Matter movement and the issues that have been uh, brought to the forefront of the American psyche for the last couple of weeks. And researchers around the world actually, not just in the United States, but around the world, have united in solidarity and taken a day for black researchers, scientists, and STEM professionals to have a day of rest and for those who would like to be allies to educate themselves, to amplify the voices of those people in STEM and academia, and also to come up with game plans for how they're going to move forward. I just want to say that we here at TWIST are going to continue to try to amplify black voices in the sciences. And if you are looking for some wonderful female black voices, go to vanguardstem.com for conversations between uh, women, uh, women scientists. And additionally, 
If you're interested in the Shutdown STEM movement, you can visit shutdownstem.com for more information and resources to educate yourself. It is it is a little tricky for me <laughs> to want to like the STEM is the one thing I've just like don't shut that like there's other things that can shut down but science, <laughs> technology, engineering and math like do we really need, like I I understand everyone's participating ah but not that like just, just keep that open just keep it going right well, yeah no, no. It's, just, it's just not no. something I really care about yeah <laughs> shut down coffee shops shut down uh, like shut down stuff I don't I don't care uh, but yes, this is this is this is why uh, this is what makes it a meaningful protest. Uh. Exactly, and this that was the idea behind it. Exactly, you hit it right on the head. It's when people are working at home, we can't block traffic so easily. We can't make as big a visible of a protest. Uh, mm. This is the protest, and uh, many large academic institutions have joined in. Uh, not. Uh, one of them being Nature, uh, Nature uh, Publishing, and there are a group of their editors who uh, have have stood today with uh, the Black community and the sciences to develop ways that they can work around publishing, which is also a huge part of the pipeline of certain voices getting amplified or diminished, and uh, trying to figure out whether or not uh, what they can do to move forward better. Additionally, archive.org, we report lots of stories from the preprint, the physics preprint journal. They uh, did not announce any new publications for today. So there were no archive announcements for today in solidarity. So there are a bunch of places. If you look around, uh, there has been, there was, there was a lot of silence, but there was also a lot of talk about what we can do better, how science how science can change for the better as an institution to have everyone's voice valued, have especially bring to the front those voices that have been historically marginalized. Yeah, I think we, we want to talk all the time about how what, science that is done well is impartial and controlled. And we've even talked about stories on the show where depending who's doing the science, there can be a skew in results. And how, um, especially when you look at medicine, it depends who uh, who are who's doing the testing and who is taking the tests, right? right. And so e we already know that we want better representation in STEM in general, mm -hmm. but even just on a practical basis to make sure we're doing good science, we need better representation just based on that. Yep. And, and I, yeah, I think it's, it's a really important time to look at the really um, kind of prolific and, and important contributors that we currently have, but also to look on our system of how we educate people in STEM and move people forward in STEM and make sure that we're, we're getting all of our voices heard. So, yeah. yeah. So if you know a, uh, a black scientist who you think would be an amazing guest on This Week in Science, someone who's doing awesome science that we should be talking about, that you want to hear about and learn more about, let me know, and I will see what I can do to get them on the show. Um, yeah, we can all work together to to have, have more voices. All right, let's move into our science for the week. I brought stories about sleep, memories, and bird brains. What'd you bring, Justin? Oh my goodness. So I've got a hormonal sea cucumber. What? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Love sea cucumber. I, yeah. uh, I've got, oh, I've got clean water through a parasitic fungi cool. and a self-destructing cancer with synthetic fungi. Oh, fungi are the future. Oh my goodness. A couple of fungi stories. Yeah. All the fun guys, totally. And Blair, what is in the animal corner? So uh, something kind of quietly came and went a couple days ago, at least in my world, since aquariums are closed and people aren't going to beaches. It was World Oceans Day. So I have oh. a story about flamingos, some of our estuary species. I have a story about water on butterfly wings and a little quick tidbit about great white sharks. 
Well, great. Yeah. As we jump into the show, I want to remind you that if you're interested in subscribing to the Twist podcast, you can find it just about any podcast podcast platform you look on. Look for This Week in Science. You can also look for This Week in Science on YouTube and Facebook. And you can go to our website directly, twist.org, T-W-I-S dot O-R-G. All right, let's dig into the science. And I would love to start with a COVID update. We <laughs> kind of slowed down on the COVID news for a week or so, but, you know, it's news not is gone. still happening. Yeah. The news yeah. is still happening. And I just want to be a part of reminding everyone that <laughs> even though you want to think that the pandemic's over, it's not. It's not. It's still here. Big time. Big, big time. So uh, nationally, numbers of infections, instead of dropping, are starting to plateau. And you know why? It's because a number of states that have opened up and uh, have started to allow business in various forms and reduce their social distancing practices, uh, the numbers of cases are starting to increase. This week, specifically, Arizona announced that they were going into emergency preparedness because they had seen a 30% increase in the number of uh, hospitalizations over the last week. Uh, so things are changing rapidly, and the dates do seem to kind of uh, trend toward uh, the Memorial Day weekend and what we saw there. Uh, so we'll see what happens further as a result of the protests. But individuals uh, uh, who work in epidemiology have been trying to run rough estimates. They say that, yeah, we probably will see an uptick from the from the protests, but not necessarily a large one immediately. It might be something more uh, on a a secondary or tertiary infection so that the people mm -hmm. from the protests infect other people and those people infect other people. So in like four weeks, we might be seeing a, a larger number of hospitalizations from the protests. But uh, there was news from the World Health Organization this week that... Oh! <laughs> <laughs> the who did something. Yeah. Yeah. After, we'll this. <laughs> after these brief announcements. Okay, so it is kind of interesting that there's, there is, oh, wait, uh, maybe Kiki's back. But uh, oh, she's, her audio still isn't, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. She can't oh, see no, us. she's reading. So she's story. going, she's, look, and she's giving it her all. Oh, man. So I'm we're going to have to, yeah. So anyway, what I was going to say, it's the death toll is equivalent to, to twice the soldiers we lost in Vietnam, which created a massive uh, blowback from society yeah. for and, and and long lingering pain. And I swear I don't feel like anybody or, or that I'm in contact with, at least in my circle of COVID freeness, is really playing that much. I mean, people are taking all the precautions. We're wearing masks. People are staying at home still. This is a massive death toll. Yeah, and I'm just seeing a lot of people just walk into the beach, meeting up with friends, giving each other hugs, and yeah. uh, heading out. Uh, I saw a bunch of uh, <clears throat> gray-haired gentlemen <laughs> sitting no, around in a circle. It. She, she just, just figured realized, it out. <laughs> drinking coffee, <laughs> sitting so close to one another, yeah. drinking coffee. I was just like, guys, you don't all live together. I know you don't. You're the worst demographic to be doing this. But I also saw an article. I don't, now I'm citing something I don't have. But I saw That's somewhere. Right. We're some winging poll, it right now. It's okay. Some poll We're in a said wing it portion that um, white male baby boomers are the most likely to disregard all of the warnings around COVID. Which is yeah. funny because they're also in the in the demographic age wise. Yeah. It's, All yeah. right. Anyway, so there is right. also where, something where in did I leave that, it? that does you... show that conservatives in general tend to pay yeah. less attention to health laws, right. whether it's or don't it's, drink this yeah. soda, don't text while driving, whatever it is, they are much less likely to follow uh, advice or regulation, even. Mm -hmm. uh, like so, that. Kiki, so, you're not going to be so. pleased. Uh, you cut out at the World Health Organization, and then we waited. And then you waited and waited. 
Uh, you got to okay. monitor when you come back because it's uh, you're not always back yet. Am I back now? Yes. You're back now. But when if you what I'm saying is if it happens if you cut out, uh, be prepared for when you get video back, your audio might not be there. So you should monitor us as we go. The problem is, is I go to a different. I go to my notes page. Yeah. And then I know. I'm reading two screens. That. You need two screens. You gotta have two screens. You're a high high end producer. You need two screens. Yep. Oh, well. <sighs> we'll fix it. We'll fix it. All right. So anyway, the this week, the World Health Organization. <laughs> I'm just going to start laughing now. The World Health Organization said uh, had a press conference in which a scientist said that asymptomatic transmission was very rare. And a bunch of scientists, hundreds of scientists from around the globe jumped on that statement to clarify that that scientist was only talking about a couple of studies that had been done in China. And they brought out multiple studies from around the world that back up the knowledge that asymptomatic transmission globally is actually common. It is a not necessarily the highest percentage of transmission. People with symptoms are more likely to transmit the virus, but Ooh, asymptomatic true? yes, asymptomatic transmission does occur a very uh, up to a quarter of the time, up to twenty six percent of the time or so. So that's very and interesting it, because and uh, it depends on different individuals. Some d individuals are much more infectious asymptomatically and never become symptomatic. Uh, and other individuals, their asymptomatic phase, they're, it's simply pre-symptomatic. They haven't gotten symptoms yet. So yeah. part of this is science communication and the <sighs> words that are used mm -hmm. specifically. Um, when you think of somebody who's asymptomatic, you think this person has it and is a carrier mm -hmm. and never gets symptoms, perhaps. Um, Pre-symptomatic is the state in which you are are infected but have not yet begun to display symptoms. Okay. Symptomatic is obvious okay. in that you have the symptoms. Um, and so it's there, a, yeah, there are lots of words that are used. Well, yeah, and part of it too is that uh, I thought we had discovered that the, the higher viral load tends to be pre-symptomatic uh, like, or, or asymptomatic, pre but pre yeah. as well. Like the that it's actually going down as you are as you are getting sick. Um, right. And so, yes. And so that's that's the basis for when you want to be want to have different kinds of tests. So mm -hmm. PCR is better earlier. Uh, the immunoglobulin um, antibody tests are better later. There there are different stages at which you want to be tested to reduce the possibility of a false positive or a false negative. Uh, that said, this statement by the World Health Organization after it wasn't a statement, but the media picked up on it and the message became transmitted through the media, sensational headlines that asymptomatic transmission is not a problem. And people right. were so if I feel fine, I'm good. But the reality uh. is the World Health Organization walked everything back and issued another statement saying, well, no, that's not what we meant. We meant to say this other thing, but the reality is, as we're talking about it, asymptomatic transmission is a thing. And so we all still need to be concerned about that. The science is, n the, the, the World Health Organization had questionable language that they used and a questionable reference that was misinterpreted. The science is not questionable on this particular aspect. Wall Street Tech in the, I think it's the YouTube chat room. Uh, saying range of infection is four meters or thirteen feet. Well, uh, I I just want to I just want to. That I depends say, on a lot of things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here's here's a good way of looking at uh, any respiratory transmittable disease. How close do you sit to a smoker? Well, if you're outside and the wind's going the right way, you can be ten feet, five feet away, and it doesn't bother you at all. Or you could be thirteen feet away in the wrong direction, and you're getting besieged with cigarette smoke. If you're indoors in a confined space without ventilation, it doesn't matter how far away you are. You're going to be inhaling 
their their secondhand smoke. So if you think about it that way, um, I like that. Yeah. Even six feet is really sort of you know even the the having that distance, which we've been practicing, is really insufficient. Thirteen feet can be better if you're outside, but again, which way is the wind blowing? You gotta pay attention. You gotta stay. Where is that toxic cloud of magic? Gotta stay glitter. upwind from the other humans. Yeah. So this this might idea. be this might be segueing nicely into Kiki's next story. But um, in San Francisco, um, the 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 thing that they said is if you're active, if you're moving, and you're within thirty feet, you have to wear a mask. If you're not moving, then you within six feet you have to wear a mask. So movement is also really important for transmission. Yeah. <laughs> it's all because people a cloud more? of probabilities. Uh, yes. Yeah. Where Where is this cloud of probabilities higher or lower? But yes, as the segue, the another study that just came out published in the uh, proceedings of the Royal Society A, it's entitled Modeling Framework to Assess the Likely Effectiveness of Face Masks in Combination with Lockdown and Managing the COVID-19 Pandemic. The researchers used mathematical modeling to uh, determine what uh, whether or not these non-pharmaceutical interventions, face masks and social distancing, uh, are effective. And lo and behold, they're a good idea. They have some, like think, speaking of these webs of probabilities, if based on their, their mathematical model, they came up with a wonderful schematic that I'm... For those of you who are watching live, I'm going to share right now because it's very colorful and fantastic. And it gives all of the parameters that were involved in their mathematical model. They had the modeled people who wear masks or people who don't wear masks. They involved also a period of infection for those people, uh, fomite inoculums. Droplet inoculums were parameters that were included. Also, when they exposed people, uh, when they were exposed, when they were asymptomatic, or in other words, pre-symptomatic, symptomatic, and when the virus uh, was removed. And they went on to look at the possibility of transmission based on all of these parameters. And in they had used a wonderful put it all together using Ooh, that's some math it's some pretty math let me tell you that um, but the the distribution of results from this this model indicate that people wearing face masks at all times are and they're with a, 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 a very effective face mask. So say like an N95 mask that they don't touch or, or move or wear around their chin all the time. Uh, they're more likely to protect others from infection than those who do not wear a face mask. So the likelihood of transmission is lower with face masks. And in the last sentence of the abstract for their paper, they say, a key message from our analyses to aid the widespread adoption of face masks, face masks would be, my mask protects you, your mask protects me. So we're getting some stroppy scientists out there telling us about mask wearing. And since asymptomatic transmission is a big probability, wear a mask at all times. Protect other people. The science says it's better. And if you're wondering about all this social distancing and the locking down and the mask wearing and all those kinds of things, whether or not they worked, you might have heard people saying, well, you know, it's fine. Nobody's in the hospital. It's great. We didn't really have that much of a problem in our state. There's a, the first peer-reviewed analysis of local, regional, national policies out of UC Berkey, Berkeley. These researchers looked at over 1,000 different regulations that were put into place in six countries over a period uh, that 
ended April 6th. So it, the, the numbers would have been bigger if the studies had if the study had uh, predicted a longer period of time. But they were looking, they based their numbers on the exponential growth that was seen at the beginning of uh, infection, reported infection, infective cases in these different countries. So taking the rate of growth from each of these countries before any lockdown policies had been put in place, they found that Shelter in place and non pharmaceutical interventions averted roughly 530 million COVID 19 infections across all of these countries. And of those infections, 62 million would have been confirmed cases. And this is an estimate based on, uh, and the, these numbers, cases versus confirmed cases, those are numbers, um, confirmed cases would have been estimated based on the number of confirmed cases that we had in these different countries. So the 530 million, the larger number, is an estimated number based on the case fatality rate and infection fatality rate that we have seen in all of these different countries. That said, the number of lives saved is in the thousands. So uh, right now for perspective cases are at about 7 million globally over 400,000 dead and um, you can imagine the numbers the larger numbers that would have died if we had allowed uh, the numbers of confirmed cases to be 62 million as opposed to seven so the uh, the study doing all of their analysis based on exponential growth uh, it suggests that everything we've been doing has been worth it. So good job, everyone. Let's keep it up. Please wear your masks and uh, we can move forward more safely. Let's take the plateau that we're seeing and drop it back down again. Continue to do as much social, social distancing as you can, if you can. Let's keep others safe. Um, and then a final study for those of you who are wondering or concerned about particular individuals who seem to have uh, more likelihood, a higher likelihood of severe respiratory infection being intubated for uh, their COVID uh, infections. A recent pre preprint that's out in the Med Archive this last week did a genome-wide association study of samples from over 1,600 hospitalized COVID patients, 2,200 healthy controls. They found genetic variants in the, uh, in the genome of individuals who were uh, under more severe respiratory distress based on COVID-19, that it, one, related to blood type, and another that's a gene cluster on chromosome 3 that's related to uh, the ACE2 amino acid, uh, that the ACE2 protein that has been discussed many times. The blood type that seems to have the worst trouble with the respiratory infection is type A. Type O appears to be protective. Uh, this is interesting, especially since it's been uh, hypothesized that this is something of a blood vessel disease. So I find that kind of interesting on top of it. Um, and then even further, the genes of interest on chromosome 3, one encodes an amino acid transporter, and uh, another encodes immune system-related chemokine receptors. And uh, both of them play a role in T-cell differentiation and recruitment during influenza viral infections, which may lead to the uh, reduced likelihood of the immune system being able to fight off the, uh, the disease. So anyone who's not type A, hey, hey, <laughs> hey, no, but like I said, this is not, these are increased risks. These are not necessarily, uh, these are not necessarily a direct track to severe infection. Science. We got lots of science. Did you want to talk about more, something more interesting than COVID? Let's move on. <laughs> Wear your masks, wash your hands, social distance. <sighs> new Tell normal, about those, yeah, troubling new times. 
Yes, new. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tell me about these sea cucumbers, Justin. So, uh, sure, no all. spoilers. No spoilers. Humans, okay. humans have hormones. Those what? hormones aren't just running amok uh, all the time. They are controlled at times by proteins that regulate our reproduction, our metabolism, the immune system, uh, other important bodily type functions. A key set of these proteins have ancient origins, according to a study published today in uh, today or earlier this week in eLife. The kispeptin, kispeptin uh, system is a group of proteins that uh, control hormones. They are released uh, released by the hypothalamus, pituitary gland, and the testicles in men, or the ovaries in women. Quoting voice. Uh, who is this? Who am I quoting? This is uh, lead author Tian Ming Wang, who's a professor at the Marine Science and Technology College, Zhejiang Ocean University, China. The origins of these proteins have previously been traced to a very simple creatures with spinal cords, but it hadn't been tracked back any further. So creatures with spinal cords are the ones that had the first hormones. Oh, but they did look further. Uh, so they started looking at all sorts of other creatures, and they looked uh, through a system in genes of sea cucumber, uh, which is a creature without a spinal cord. It's uh, They identified basically the equivalence of the kispeptin genes in the sea cucumber. Next, they found that administering kispeptin uh, proteins to m mammal cells caused them to release calcium, similar to how human versions of the protein would behave. Uh, the sea cucumber proteins were also able to interact with receptors in human cells, suggesting that very little has changed in these proteins over the course of pretty much all of uh, complex life evolution. <laughs> it's a really long time for these func to, for a function to be preserved. That is uh, awesome and amazing. Uh, these experiments suggest that the kispeptin system predates the evolution of the spinal cord. So if your hormones seem to be strong, remember, they are the definition of primal. Uh, they are older than vertebrates. And yes, they are trying to control you because that's what they're there for. Uh, and that's what they have done for most of uh, animal evolution. If I may, this, <laughs> this makes nothing but sense to me because... Sea cucumbers, sea stars, they're broadcast spawners. Huh. And yeah. so they somehow just have to know, release all the sperm, release all the eggs. Like <laughs> release the kraken. How do you <laughs> regulate that but with hormones? Yes. And they can be they can their moods can turn on a dime. <laughs> yeah. You don't, <laughs> you don't want to be on the wrong end of a sea cucumber, let me tell you. <laughs> What is the wrong end of a sea, cu sea cucumber? I mean, they're <laughs> they're probably pretty equal. <laughs> it's, it's all good. Sea cucumbers, they're cute. I mean, they poop sand, so their butt can't be that gross. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little World Oceans Day trivia for you. <laughs> really? They poop sand? Yeah. How? They're like what? they're like little they're the ocean's vacuum cleaners. They're like picking up okay. Well, I mean they're not I mean they don't create sand. They ingest a bunch of sand when they eat poop they eat and the stuff sand. like that. So they eat yeah. poop and they poop out basically clean well, sand. So which like end a, is actually the gross end? Isn't there like a fish that like you don't poops want to kiss the white mouth. sand? That like actually like creates a type of sand that's like on the white beaches? I thought there was a fish that pooped like a uh, calcium Deposit or something. That, I, I'm am I making that up, that. or did I hear that wrong? I can do a no. quick fact check in the in our mini break. Do some, we'll do some quick fact checking on Justin's. There's a fish that poops sand <laughs> fish that, that makes up. Okay, we just Google fish well, that poop sand. poop sand. Now we know. Now we know. And your hormones—they've been around for a long time. But you know, maybe our hormones are still acting the way they do because they want us to be broadcast spawners. 
Oh, th- th- this was a very quick fact check. Noah tells me, so this is a real source. Mm-hmm. This is great. Check Uh-oh. your source, everybody, well, when you Google. Um, that parrotfish create the, the white sand on the Thank beaches you. of Hawaii. They scrape Thank algae off of rocks and dead corals. They grind up the calcium carbonate of the corals, and mm-hmm. that becomes the sand on the beach. That makes sense. Very interesting. So when you go to Hawaii yes. and you rub your toes in the uh, white sand beaches, yes. fish poop. Yeah, it's passed through the gut of a fish. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, hasn't wonderful. most things passed through the gut of a fish? I feel or like a worm. all or water. A worm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, something like that. Okay. But yeah, white sands are uh, thanks to the parrotfish uh, munching on coral. Mm. I learned so much in this little hormonal <laughs> interlude. <laughs> Oh, oh, yeah. oh, oh, I see one of the, the chat rooms are all full of people who knew the answer ahead of us. Thank you, chat room. Oh, oh, we yeah. have such yeah. smart listeners. We have such great mm-hmm. listeners. So, yes. Thank you for knowing more than we do. If you just tuned in, this is This Week in Science. If you are interested in a twist mug or shirt or face mask or other fun item of twist merchandise, head to twist.org and click on the Zazzle link to browse our store and buy something. All right. It is that time for more animal stuff. This is a perfect a perfect segue into Blair's Animal Corner. She loves our creature, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a What you got, Blair? Oh, pamingos. Pami- what P- color are P- they? P- <laughs> pamingos. <laughs> What's a pamingo? It's like a pomelo. <laughs> oh, no. Strap in, everybody. Flamingos. They're pink. Oh, there we go. Are they? <laughs> oh, boy. Um, a new study from University of Exeter looked at how pink flamingos are and their aggression towards one another in relation to food. And they found that there was a difference. That um, pink plumage normally is a sign of good health in lesser flamingos so a bright color usually means good health and time to breed speaking of those hormones the pinkest flamingos both the male and female turns out they were more aggressive towards their neighbors that came to food makes sense yeah so they they found out that the birds fight more also just in general When the food is in a smaller area and kind of a central place, as opposed to spread out over a wide space of food. Also makes sense, right? We know that the color of pink flamingos comes from carotenoids, beta carotene in their food, which for the lesser flamingos is usually algae. For uh, larger flamingos, it's often krill. But it has to do with filter feeding in the water. That's why their beak is shaped like that. They dunk their head upside down in the water. They slap it together and they have these projections in their mouth that look almost like baleen. They're, they're made out of keratin, just like that, like baleen. So they can filter through the water as they smack their beak together and get as much food as they can from the water. Um, so that's how they get their pink color. So, for example, um, flamingos in zoos are pink because the food, the dry food that, that they're provided actually has the carotenoids in it. Otherwise, they would be whitish. But I doubt that they uh, exhibit the same uh, aggression with pink colorness as do the the wild ones. Not so. So mm-hmm. it's it's pretty consistent. So the the pinker flamingos are in fact the um, the more aggressive. But I do I do know that z- zoo flamingo food always has the stuff in it. It's supplemented perfectly for flamingos. So uh, they didn't do this study with flamingo food that was lacking carotenoids. So we don't know if you just have a white flamingo flock, if there's a difference or not. I would assume it would kind of be hard to measure at that point. But the idea is that actually the pinkness is how you can measure who's been best fed. Yes. So um, basically 
a couple of things from this. The main one is that this can impact how we manage flamingos in captivity. And that as seems obvious now, you would want to feed food over a wide area so that they don't have to compete with one another because it is kind of this feedback loop, right? So if the better fed flamingo is going to be more aggressive, it will continue to be the better fed flamingo. Which if you're out in the wild and you have an entire marshland to pick from, it might not see, be so bad. But inside of a, a very specific amount of space, it could be a problem. Yeah, it makes sense. The aggressive yeah. uh, flamingo gets the <laughs> gets the pink. I mean, yeah, that makes right. sense. And so actually, if you spread out the food, you end up getting overall pinker and more relaxed flamingos because everyone's getting more food. But what I thought was interesting about this actually was that I see a kind of chicken and egg. I know what you're going to say, Justin. You know what the answer is. But it's like a chicken. Egg. Yeah, yeah. But you, it's kind of a which came first situation because are the pinker flamingos aggressive because they're stronger or are they aggressive and therefore eat more? I bet it's a. I would assume it was the aggression first, just because that's probably how they got the 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 push the other birds out of the feeding spot in the first place. Right, and then you they assume got assume that. That's what I would assume. But also, just being having more energy and being stronger by being better fed could mm -hmm. also impact that. So, it's yeah. Which yeah, but I bet there's some birds who just the like other. they get they get their belly full and they're like okay. I'm going to go wander over here for a while and just, you know, hang, like make a little mud uh, nest or something, whatever flamingos do in their off time. Yeah, you know, you could got also it. be, it could also <laughs> be that honest signaling. There are two different, um, you know, that people have been looking at carotenoids and how they influence the coloration of birds for a long time. We have birds like the Western tanager, which is mm -hmm. a songbird that its head, it's yellow, but its head turns bright red in the spring when it's eating and summer when it's eating particular food sources. Um, and it's the food that causes the red coloration. Mm -hmm. So um, also finches, uh, the house finches are, are pinker or redder uh, with more of, of various foods. So, I mean, it's an honest signal, but I mm -hmm. don't know, you know, it, it could all depend on, okay, you're a young bird, but in that, formative moment you were you caught a cold or maybe you had some kind of parasite or something and so you weren't as energetic you didn't get the food and then you're not pink and then you don't have the food and it's a reinforcing it's a cycle sad story <laughs> <laughs> that's nature man oh, or nature. you just happen to be the individual who gets to the food first and oh, yeah. so they're more for you and you have more energy and then you're red um you know, it could just be correlational, but still an an honest signal. Yeah, I kind of thought, I assume that the 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 zoo uh, flamingos or whatever. Yeah, about? flamingos. Um, yeah, you got flamingos. it. Flamingos uh, would uh, would actually just like they would have had better food dispersal from the zookeepers, so they would have all been kind of they wouldn't have to compete in a zoo. But I guess uh, even in even in a zoo, it's a confined. Situation, I guess that's fierce competition in in a zoo. I never thought of it that way. But, it yeah. could be, yeah. I think that it, it depends on what you're trying to do. And if you have a if you have a water feature in a flamingo exhibit and you really want them to forage, then you might be inclined to put the majority of the food in the water, mm -hmm. which might make it a more central location that is yep. not as dispersed. So you could definitely see how how different ideas of the best way to care for flamingos could end up being conflicting mm -hmm. there yeah or i want to know conflicting. how this i want to know how this all goes into those social groups that you talked about previously about how they have these friend groups that mm -hmm. last for long periods of time i mean does angry bob just have he, he doesn't have any consistent friends or are all of his friends pink yeah, is it like the the cheerleaders at the table in the cafeteria? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what the really nice ones? No. Oh, I'm so sweet. Oh, well, maybe yeah, not. Yeah. You. Yeah, uh, which I will mention, there was consistency in this uh, experiment across males and females. Interesting. So it 
it probably is not a sexual signaling thing because it was pretty consistent. Yeah. I guess you'd so. want to see if this was something that changed in individuals over different breeding seasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you'd want to follow an individual from year to year to year to be like, okay, this year Bob's pink. This year Bob's not so pink. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good question. Yeah. But in the meantime, better care for flamingos. Um, so then moving on um, to better care for humans or humans. Uh, so this is a story about potential biomimicry in water resistance. So when we think about butterfly wings, do we think of be them being super, super powerful or maybe kind of fragile? Because I've pinned insects before. And they feel pretty fragile. <laughs> Especially butterfly wings. Yeah. But an analysis of high-speed raindrops hitting biological surfaces, including feathers, plant leaves, and insect wings, reveals that they are actually highly water-repelling surfaces that can reduce the impact of water. So they have uh, their scales, aren't they, on a butterfly's wing? Yes. we Well, kind of. Yeah, it's textured. It's, it's, it's kind of pointy. So we've talked before about how insect wings are antimicrobial because they have kind of these points and, and almost needle-like projections that kind of tear apart the casing on viruses and bacteria. So um, that we did know that, that they're kind of pokey. Uh, but specifically with water, it's, it's a very interesting thing to think about because so in previous studies, um, we have looked at water hitting insects and plants and saw that the liquids cleaning, um, the liquid when it hits it can hit at up to 10 meters per second. And so then they would measure the raindrops falling on hydrophobic natural surfaces, the ones I mentioned before. But the way that they explain what that means, 10 meters per second on raindrops, that's equivalent to by weight us getting hit by a bowling ball falling oh from the sky. <laughs> what? So each Ooh, individual wow. raindrop has the potential to be really dangerous to a little butterfly. So they, they collected their samples of these natural things. Then they grabbed the insect wings from Cornell University, the insect collection. Then they placed the samples on a table. They released water drops from the heights of height about two meters, and they recorded the impact a few thousand frames per second with a high-speed camera. And what they found was that when a drop hits the surface, it ripples and spreads, and that on top of that, there's actually a nanoscale wax wax layer that repels it. And then these micro-scale bumps, the kind of projections I was talking about, they actually make the raindrop spread out. So the way they talk about that is, is it's as if you dropped a balloon onto a needle <laughs> and it broke into a bunch of pieces, right? So basically that's what it's doing with the water droplet. Because of these little projections, it's breaking apart the water droplet. It's reducing the amount of time the drop is in contact with the surface, which limits momentum. It lowers impact force. And it also reduces heat transfer because insect muscles have to be really warm to be able to move. And so they can't fly unless mm. their, their wings are warm. So if they're getting hit by raindrops and it's cooling them down, then they won't be able to fly. So this you don't is really a, see butterflies s flying in the rain very no, often. but I'm thinking it's like right after <laughs> yeah. when they could just yeah. potentially be stuck. Um, but yeah, so it it helps. Uh, it helps that also helps from weighing them down because water's heavy. So if they got saturated, that would be hard. So this is a really cool look at this waxy property of the wing that makes it repellent, but also the, the texture of the wing that breaks apart the water droplets and allows them. Oh, yeah, look at him go. Allows them to. To kind of spread the water out so that the impact is reduced and so they don't get wet. So this is something that we could absolutely apply to water resistant sprays de-icing coatings on airplane wings, the way we oh, manufacture plastics. 
Would so this work? I'm, I'm thinking though. This is uh, this is all microscopic stuff. You know mm-hmm. what we're what we're talking about is nanoscale molecular interactions that affect the surface tension of the water. Mm-hmm. So, at I'm just trying to imagine it working at the macro scale needed for you know an airplane wing or you know. Would it would it matter if I mean if you have a material that is built in that mm-hmm. nanoscale way, would mm-hmm. it act in the same would would it at the macro scale mm-hmm. still have that same effect? Right. And is rain a problem for airplanes? Not rain, but ice. Ice. Uh, oh yeah. Ice. Yeah. Yeah. I, I yeah, I, I guess I think it's an interesting yeah. question. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, I know that they've, for example, this shark skin is also naturally antimicrobial. And that's because they have these dermal denticles. They basically are covered in teeth. (laughs) It's another World Oceans Day fact for you. Um, So they have mimicked that in the creating of like um, food prep surfaces and um, cutting boards. And that has reduced, to my knowledge, it has reduced the ability for uh, potential yuck to grow on it right so viruses and bacteria and stuff. Right. so mm-hmm. that in that case that they scaled they scaled up but also sharks are pretty big sometimes but it is kind of it is on a very very small scale if you look at the individual denticles it's not as small as the as these guys but it it still is something that works at the at the microscopic and you can kind of scale it up right. to different types of surfaces so you could see how Potentially, this could work similarly. Yeah, and they're definitely going that direction. Mm-hmm. I love it. I love using nature to create mm-hmm. to create new materials and figure out new ways of solving problems. Yeah, yeah and something yeah. so delicate that's yeah. helping us fortify our own stuff. That's crazy. I think that's a the, yeah. Putting it that way, Blair. That's I think the the thought process that led to this investigation is how to really these really really delicate structures have that strength. How do yeah. they maintain their integrity? Yeah, big question. Super cool. Mm-hmm. Super cool. And uh, now I'm going to look at butterflies differently. I'll be like, you're wearing armor. Yeah, better than mine. Thank you for listening to Twist out there. You are the reason that we are able to do what we do every week, bring you up-to-date and down-to-earth views on science discoveries, science news. And with your help, we can do even more. We can bring a sane perspective to a world full of misinformation together. Head over to twist.org right now, click on the Patreon link, and choose your level of support and be a part of bringing sanity and science to even more people. We can't do what we do without you. Thank you for your support. And we're back. You're listening to This Week in Science. We are back. And I've got bird brains. Well, I don't have bird brains. I've You've got a been story. having bird brains. <laughs> I've, I've had bird brains forever. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I, if, if you've been listening to this show for a while, you know that I love the bird brains. And so when a story comes up, I jump on it. This one I thought was really interesting because it has to do with how uh, corvids, the group that involves jays, crows, ravens, the birds that we like to think of as so extra special smart, um, what is it about them that gives them that extra little oomph? to give them the smarts that they have. They're big birds, and so with big birds come big brains. But they also have interesting behaviors in that they live in intimate social groups. They uh, they also, very similar to people, have 
childhoods that are fairly extended. They hang out with their parents for a very long time. So researchers at the Max Planck Institute for Science of Human History looked into the question of how parenting impacts intelligence in non-humans, in these birds, bird-brained creatures. So first they looked at the sizes of the brains and they looked at this link between parental care and intelligence. So they looked at thousands of species, more than 120 corvids, and in their new study comparing the brain of the corvids to other birds, they found that ravens' brains, corvids' brains, uh, ravens' brains especially, account for almost 2% of its body mass. <laughs> and that's on the level of human brains. Human brains are a fairly large percentage of our body mass as well, which makes us an outlier in the animal kingdom. The interesting part of this is birds, we think, minimize their brain size for flight. They try to be efficient and have a brain that doesn't weigh them down. So what is worth having the bigger brain to these birds? Does this, Do the smarts make up for it? Um, they look to see the intelligence of various birds. They've looked for years at species like Siberian jays, New Caledonian crows, and they know that they can solve very important puzzles and different tasks very easily. Very often these birds, though, the babies will follow their parents around and they will uh, all the and learn from the parents. The parents will while they're feeding them, while they're raising the babies for an extended period of time, actually teach them how to do things and feed the babies. So they think, they hypothesize that what's going on in this extended childhood, this extended parental care for the jays, the crows, the, ra the ravens, is that they're sticking around longer, they're learning how to do complex behaviors from the parents. Meanwhile, the parents are taking care of things like feeding them for much longer periods of time. So if they're not getting a task that involves, say, putting a piece of straw into a hole to collect an ant, then it doesn't matter because the parent has got their back. They're not going to die because mm. their parent like is there. It's like a safety net. There's a safety net, right. Mm -hmm. So there's this extra amount of caloric value that the parents continue to give the young for sometimes up to two to four years, which is a very long time. These are long-lived birds, and this is a very long period of time. Normally, birds fledge and are gone from their, parent their parents' care within one season. So it's mm -hmm. very, and maybe they're, they hang around for two seasons, but it's not, it's not common. Um, so this is really interesting, very similar to humans in that we stick around, our parents feed us, so that we have that time to learn from them. So maybe there are particular evolutionary uh, conditions, say the researchers, that helped our, our big brains and their big brains grow and gain the intelligence that was needed. Um, so anyway. So the crows are also the... The birds from the famous study, which famous study? The one with the masks where they, there was yes. a, a person yes. who tormented the birds and a person who treated the birds well. And then their offspring knew which human to trust and which human to stay away from without having ever met them. Right. So this is also some really complex learning that's happening between generations. So... I wonder if this is related to that, that there's this really complex knowledge getting moved from generation to generation. Is that easier because their brains are bigger, because they stay with their their parents longer? It's interesting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's very it's very interesting. So uh, more evidence in birds. This is beyond even primate species that parental care, extended parental care uh, may have may be the key to that cognitive leg up mm. yeah it's very interesting tell me a story justin it might be worth uh instituting some sort of i don't know prolonged maternity leave 
Go. Oh, mm. You might say that. This is. Mm. This is I mean, pu public policy is not our wheelhouse, but uh, you know, uh, <laughs> follow the science to the good outcome. Yeah. One, please. <laughs> oh, okay. So, uh, cyanobacteria, uh, which are AKA uh, blue green algae, usually show up in the summer as uh, that green scum on the surface of the water. Uh, and, and throughout the water in some cases. Uh, the mass development of these is apparently really bad for water quality as they actually deprive the water of oxygen. So stuff living in water uh, that has a lot of this blue-green allergy has less available oxygen. And they also produce toxins. Uh, but thankfully, there is something that can make them sick. This is uh, researchers from the Leibniz Institute for Freshwater Ecology and Inland Fisheries has found out that these uh, the infections by a fungal parasite not only kill the cyanobacteria, but then it, this, this process also makes it easier for blue-green algae to be consumed by their natural predators. So it kills them, so then now they're not reproducing, and it becomes a nutrition source for stuff which uh, may not always be able to access them through this toxins. So this was, uh, let's see, this was a, a filamentous fungi of some sort that they used here. Uh, so there is there's uh, there is an increase in cyanobacteria, blue-green algae blooms. They like the warm water and as higher temperatures start showing up around the world, we're getting uh, larger uh, blooms taking place in, in fresh waters. These uh, affect the, the water quality, but then also, again, because of the oxygen, they can lead to fish death and other ar aquatic ar organisms down the food chain as well uh, suffer from this. So they, we may, th this was a, they, they may have found uh, this, paras uh, this, excuse me, this parasitic fungi that, that, can, that can counter it. It's sort of an interesting fix, <laughs> you know, from from how we're used to categorizing and quantifying. Uh, if you knew you had a parasitic fungi in your water, mm -hmm. you might be less likely to drink it. You know, oh, I don't want that. And again, you should probably, it should still be filtered out by the time it, it gets into your system. Right? To be clear, but but treating uh, treating you know freshwater lakes with the uh, filamentous fungi might be one way to clear them up just as long as it's not like bringing in cane toads to australia to get rid of the locusts <laughs> and they yeah. explode out of out of control and just riddled with them i don't yeah i mean i would hope this would be implemented if implemented that it would be implemented in not so in a controlled manner, yes. not so much a of just course. throw it out into the wild. Well, kind of. So so part of the <laughs> part of the part of the problem with the cane toads is they aren't food for anything yeah. else. Yeah. Uh the benefit uh or the, the side attribute of this uh filamentous fungi is that it is a food source for a lot of things in the water. So um, it is. It does have its own natural predators that are there, yeah. and it doesn't have, uh, you know, it's not immune to predation itself. So uh, the, the, this may be a bit more of a win-win ecological fix than, than cane toads, which is, yeah, the ultimate fail uh, example. I mean, they seemed like a good idea at the time. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but when you're when you're also when you're looking at uh, a situation where you're applying something because a food web is failing, mm -hmm. uh, and you, you are you uh, you're hoping to preserve that food web, and yeah. and so what they have discovered thus far is a particular parasitic fungi that uh, seems to like to attack the blue green algae. And also gets uh, the blue green algae. It becomes a nutrition source, and it itself is a nutrition source for that food web. So it very happy and healthy thus far uh, for the food web. Win win. Happy and healthy food web. We love it. Clean what water. Yeah. Clean water. No blue green algae. 
Yeah. 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 Healthy for everyone. Don't be a downer, Blair. Well, to be fair, to you. I'm <laughs> not Do a sure. fact check. Well, to be fair, Blair, I mean, uh, to, to Blair, I'm not sure that a whole lot of research was really done before the cane toads were brought over. I don't think right. that was, I don't think the footwork, the preliminary footwork had been done uh, to see, to, to do an impact uh, report or really think anything through. In, I mean, it happened a lot. There were, they brought cats to Israel and now they're all over the Middle East. <laughs> feral cats everywhere. It's, you know. Yeah. It's happened Ashish, here and there. <laughs> Ashish Pant says, I hope the fungus is also toxic to Asian carp in the lakes. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, maybe Probably we can get not. rid of zebra Probably mussels, true. Asian carp, a bunch of those mm -hmm. <laughs> terrible invasive species that we have problems mm -hmm. with. Uh well, you know what? We all get tired at some point. Mm -hmm. Everyone mm -hmm. gets a little bit tired. Mm -hmm. And a recent study out of Los Alamos National Laboratory from a computer scientist, Yijing Watkins, uh, has discovered that neural networks that have been uh, trained to learn in the way that developing human brains learn. Uh, they, she says, we were fascinated by the prospect of training a neuromorphic processor in a manner analogous to how humans and other biological systems learn from their environment during childhood development. She discovered that they need sleep. Not necessarily <laughs> sleep, but they Wait. need... What? Ar want, what? Artificial intelligent brains also we require downtime? Yes, that is the take-home message from this study that just came out of uh, LANL. Is that like when your computer's freaking out and you just need to restart it? Just, well, it just yes, needs a nap. It just needs a quick nap. It just needs a minute. Yeah. So they discovered that uh, while they were trying to get these neural networks to work and to approximate the activity in human brains and human neural networks, they found that there were there were instabilities that they started they would be fine and then over a period of time they would become unstable and they would not work well anymore and kind of as a last ditch effort to try and stabilize the systems they played a kind of white noise to the artificial network and it what they compare it to is uh is pretty much like the uh, slow wave activity during sleep in which it's a wide range of frequencies and amplitudes, but it gave a kind of cleansing uh, to the neural network. Uh, this white noise, it would kind of like static between radio stations. They say it's just a lot of, a lot of frequencies and amplitudes. And in doing that, it enabled the neural networks to work more efficiently and more stably. And this implies that future human-like artificial intelligences may need to sleep. So, so they don't, they're not gonna be able to stay awake all the time. They can't win. They'll yeah, go to imagine, sleep sometime. <laughs> can you imagine if your laptop is like, ah, it's got it, it's gonna sleep Let's now sleep for the next now. eight hours and I can't use it. Oh, it's back. Oh, wait, why is it overheating? Oh, it's exercising. Why is it doing that? Okay, it's cool back down again. Okay, but now it needs, it's, it's, uh, in, now it's, uh, uh, taking another break. Okay, well, I guess I'm working around your schedule. <laughs> yeah, they thought this would, this is really interesting because, um, other different kinds of dynamic networks that have been, uh, that have been developed, uh, we've talked about lots of them, uh, over, over the years talking about, um, uh, what kinds of various kinds of natural learning based networks um, they they can use various algorithms and methods to maintain stability in their systems and so s some of these algorithmic learning networks are are much more stable and don't need to sleep but this particularly spiking neural networks that are trained to be similar to human brains they fault in the same way that human brains do and need rest. So fascinating.
Yeah. It also explains why my uh, my uh, I jumped on my computer the other day and it was uh, in an incognito mode in the browser and there was a hardware catalog that seemed to be scrolling through. I, it disappeared immediately after I, 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 mm -hmm. I opened up the computer, but that was very interesting. I, mean, I couldn't quite figure yeah, out why that the was. The computer's going to try and build itself a friend. No. Uh, if, another story on the on the sleep front, a uh, study looking at mice, which, you know, mice are the smartest animals in the universe, mm -hmm. uh, smartest life forms in the universe. A uh, study out of, uh, well, it was published in Neuron this last week, looking at newborn adult neurons. So there's, we've talked about the question of whether new neurons are born in the hippocampus of adult humans. We know that uh, there are lots of these newborn brain neurons in the developing brain, but what about adults? We haven't been able to confirm it or deny it in adults so f adult humans so far, but we've seen it in mice and rats. So this study looks in mice. They found these newborn neurons in the hippocampus. They associated them with a memory. So they found newborn neurons that after a, a shock-based memory, so they apply a shock to the mouse, the mouse goes, ah, and then the, ner the neurons in the brain light up. They, just, they determined which ones were newly born that lit up during the, or were activated during the experience. And then they look to see whether or not they get activated again during sleep. During, uh, during rapid eye movement, during dreaming, because this is a phase of sleep which is thought to help consolidate memories that you've learned and put them into long-term storage. They saw that once again, some of these newborn neurons got activated during the rapid eye movement phase of sleep. Okay, and so then they went, oh, let's see if we can mess with those. And so they used optogenetics to use light to turn these neurons on and off. And they found that if they disrupted those neurons, these newborn neurons during this REM sleep phase, the memories were not remembered as well as if the neurons, as if those newborn neurons were not messed with. So in mice, this study confirms that ne adult newborn neurons are involved in the formation of new memories and that they need to be reactivated again while you're sleeping, specifically dreaming, for those memories to actually take hold. Hmm. There's no reason to think that this wouldn't happen in people if we have newborn neurons being born in our brains, which is exciting. Mm -hmm. We need to have the baby neurons to make the new dreams. Hmm. Justin? Yeah, okay. Uh, so all human body cells have a certain lifespan during which there's these uh, cells perform essential duties. And at the end of the lifespan, they reach senescence, which sounds like a nap. Uh, but no. it basically, they kind of retire. They're no longer able to perform their regular it's duties. It's pre-death, basically. It's Free death. death. Yeah. yeah. And then, Almost and then, dead. as all cells do at some point, they commit suicide. They oh, hit Bob the self destruct Tosis. button, they Dr. Kevorkian, and they, they leave. Oh, uh, this suicidal death is programmed into the genes through a process called apoptosis. That's just what causes them to self destruct in order to make way for the fresh, the young, the healthy, the new generation of cells that will replace them. Uh, mutations sometimes interfere with this process. This can be caused by simply by aging. Uh, ultraviolet light is thought to have an effect of various mutagenic compounds. Mut these mutations disable the apoptosis genes, uh, re re resulting in zombie cells. So these are cells that are, are the living undead. They refuse to, to, to die. They don't commit suicide. They don't hit the self-destruct button. And they kind of stop performing the functions still. They still aren't performing normal cell functions. What's more, they can uh, spread this gene to other uh, otherwise healthy working cells, turning them also into the living and dead. It's a classic zombie uh, apocalypse.
taking place. Uh, we usually refer to this this process taking place as cancer. That that's what cancer is. It's it starts with the uh, the lack of signaling to stop uh, to to, to self destruct, and then it uh, also lacks the signaling for uh, ceasing to grow or having these rest periods between growth, and you get the you basically runaway cells throughout the body. So. Previously, scientists had identified an anti-cancer compound, FE399, and a species of fungus called Ascochtia, or something somewhat similar to that, uh, which is often found, uh, which is a, a, a something that normally afflicts cereals, cereal food crops. Um, but the compound is just uh, is a specific type of amino acid group that works to induce somehow uh, aptosis in cancerous human cells. Problem is, can't really make enough of the fungus to express this specifically. Da, 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 da. Anyway, uh, this, this research here, which is, uh, where is this? This is Tokyo University of Science, Professor Isamu uh, Shina, along with Dr. Takiyuki Ton. Noe, oh boy, I'm terrible at pronouncing names I'm reading for the first time. Uh, they both accepted the challenge <laughs> and they worked, worked really hard. And uh, Cody Voice, we wanted to create a, a compound that could treat colon cancer. And we aimed to do this through the synthesis of FE399. So this is a total synthesis process of complete chemical production of this complex molecule using commercially available precursors which allowed them to achieve some mass production. The team figured that first, the structure of this uh, peptide would need to be identified. This was simple, and they could easily uh, perform it using commercially available and inexpensive materials. Following that simple start, the subsequent procedures required many, many steps that, required, that resulted in some failure, and then some more failure. Oh, so they just gave so up. So much failure. No, they kept going. They just, oh yeah, no, they did. Uh, they eventually had a major breakthrough. Their mass spectrometry and nuclear magnetic resonance studies confirmed that a trio, trio of spots on a plate showed identical chemical signature to the known formula of Fe399, meaning they did it. They successfully recreated it synthetically. So what that means is they had a, uh, an increased yield of about 20%, which is promising uh, now already but uh, now has bigger implications for future large-scale production. So uh, this is just one example of uh, people working really hard <laughs> to see that the future is brighter for all of us, prolonging human longevity and making for a, a happier, healthier society. Yeah, and as... Gaurav Sharma in the chat room is saying, this is a great time to remember Henrietta Lacks. Her cells were immortalized as the HeLa cancer cell line, which is still used today in research. Um, and she was a black American woman. And yeah. wasn't she, wasn't the, weren't they also taken without her knowledge? Taken without, without permission. Taken without, and, and, uh, yeah. uh, yes. And she, lots of, uh, she was lots a, of Pharmaceuticals and, and have been created off of this subject. Yes, lots of lots of, of wealth has been created for this, and she's received. Her family has received nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. 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 Just worth. Just wanted to throw it out there. It's kind of an important part of it. Hey, yeah. Welcome to America. Come into America. Yeah. We'll take your cells. Yeah. Hopefully, science. Uh, and scientists are working hard, have been working hard for decades to change the institution of science and how science is done. Uh, now uh, human subjects have to be asked for their permission to be used in a study. Even Facebook using your data and analyzing it and publishing it in a study without your permission is not legal. It's not. It's also not cool. It is not cool. Yes, Facebook deciding to use to do different uh, to give different streams feeds of information to people to see what works best without asking you. Mm -hmm. mm. Not necessarily. 
ethical. This is This Week in Science, and we would love to have you help us grow twists. Help us grow our audience. Get a friend to subscribe today. All right, we've got some quick science news here at the end of the show. I want to tell you about mate choice. That's what we're going to talk about. Mm. We're going to talk about mate choice. So, Blair, tell me what you know about mate choice. What is mate choice? (laughs) How much time you got? (laughs) Oh, oh, Um, quick question. Sometimes the mate is chosen by the woman, by the female. Sometimes chosen by the male. Sometimes when they're hermaphrodites, it has to be consensual or not. Sometimes mate choice is consensual. Sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's based on pheromones. Sometimes it's based on how they look, what they're doing, mm-hmm. how they sound. Yeah. Ed Justin. from the uh, secret uh, from the secret twist chat room had earlier asked if uh, if females do any mate selection in flamingos. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, as far as the how pink they are, mm-hmm. I don't think so. Okay. Mm, but interesting i will i will fact check that as well yeah because it's like it's like you're saying it's one of those signals for well fed and healthy and it could be one of those sorts of things and you you would expect them yeah if it's now if it's to pass on the gene pool i understand all the aggression it makes sense so it's it's, they do do dancings they do dancing and they are monogamous which i'm gonna say with like air quotes because most animals that we call monogamous just means they stick together for Many year. years. Oh, many. Oh. A year, many it's years. Monogamy, anyway. Then sometimes they break up. <laughs> yeah. As all couples sometimes do. Sometimes it's a season. Sometimes. Sometimes it's multiple. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Yes. There you go. Sometimes flamingos just drift apart. They do. It's, it's true. So, mate choice. Mate choice, as Blair was saying, it has many different mates are choosing. Choosing? Mates are chosen many different ways. Microbiome. In humans, yes. In humans, it's like, oh, a woman and a man, maybe they like each other. You know, what is the story that you tell little kids about, oh, they fall in love and everything. And then, then, the, then they have a baby, right? Well, not necessarily. Where There's a lot of issues with infertility and questions surrounding how, where's the, is, why is so much infertility unexplained. Mm-hmm. And so researchers this week published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B on their work looking at the choosiness of the egg mm. itself. Mm. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. They took eggs and sperm from people who had chosen each other Mm -hmm. and from people who were not chosen. And they put the eggs and the sperm together in dishes in the laboratory. They used the follicular fluid, which is the fluid that surrounds the egg. And there's all sorts of chemicals in this fluid. We don't really know what all of them do, but they have to do with chemo attraction uh, generally. So it's thought that maybe... It's involved in choosing particular sperm, attracting particular sperm to themselves. Come to me. The chemicals are saying that to the sperm. And they hypothesized, their hypothesis was that people who behaviorally chose each other, a woman who chose a man, that her egg would choose his sperm. Hmm. Nope. That's not what happened. That's not how nature works. It's not how nature works. And so they found that even though you may choose each other, the egg may not choose the sperm. And there may be fertility problems that arise from that situation. They did not, however, they haven't looked into the sperm side of the equation as closely because this... uh, Yeah, they haven't looked into the sperm side of the equation as closely to see whether or how the sperm might be involved in choosing the egg. The open yeah. question is still, I thought it was the, the other sperm way around. aren't really yeah. so choosy. No, no. the sperm is it. cheap. You just want to get yeah. your DNA as many places as possible. The egg yeah. has to be choosy because that's a, that's a nine-month commitment and, you know, yeah. kind of like a 20-year commitment. Yeah. 
and the sperm is like, I'm the sperm. I'm here. So am I. Me too. Over there. What? Oh my God. How many of us are there? Oh, I didn't know. I didn't see all that. Oh, geez. There's only yeah. one egg in here. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. So bottom line, sperm choice by the egg's follicular <sighs> fluid is not related to who you choose. <clears throat> right. So this is also kind of related to um, quick tangent that in captivity, uh, when we try to breed animals who we decide like are genetically a really good match, right? So that's part of the job is to make sure, especially the endangered species, you have a limited number. You want to make that into as large of a number as you can while reducing bad mutations or recessive genes being exposed. So you pick a good match. Sometimes it still doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And unless the numbers are extremely low for that individual species, you take that as a sign and you move on. And you try to find a new pairing because there's other stuff going on. If it's not working or if they don't want to mate at all because there's some sort of chemical cue going on, there's something there most likely that, that we didn't see. Mm -hmm. So, the, I mean, this is this is directly related to that. There could be stuff going on in terms of compatibility that we just totally. I, 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 I guarantee you if you if you will one day figure out probably not in the too distant future, it's all microbiome. Yeah. You just, the gut microbes are like, no, I don't want those ones. Except don't, doesn't your microbiome start to resemble each other when you live together? Yes, yeah, absolutely, it does. It does. But I don't so it think... has to be a good match. Are you talking about behaviorally, the behavior microbiome? Because I don't think the microbiome is influencing your egg and sperm. Oh, oh absolutely. You think, I don't think so. Okay. Absolutely. It doesn't go that deep. Justin oh, is Justin. a microbiome truther. Just a, <laughs> a truther. Ooh. Stop. Ouch. <laughs> Loaded word. <laughs> it's uh, all the microbiome, you know? Yeah. Um, and then my last story for the show. I just want you to know we're so similar wherever you are. Wherever you are in the world, you're like me, kind of. We're kind of like each other more than we're unless not like a, each other. Unless you're a jerk. <laughs> in case you're then not. Then we're not alike at Then you're not no. like us. No, yeah. we're like that. Uh, researchers from the University of California, Riverside, published a paper in the Journal of Personality this week looking at, uh, they teamed with researchers from 62 countries around the world to ask people a question. What do you remember the most from yesterday? Hmm. Yes. Uh, this was follow-up work from a study that was called The World at Seven, which found, which looked into what people were doing at 7 p.m. on the previous day. And they found that people only, they didn't look at as, as many countries. They only looked at a couple. They found that people in countries seemed to be doing similar stuff around 7 p.m., around the world. This expands on it. This time, they're including 15,000 some odd members of university and college communities, 10,771 females, 4,468 males, 79 without a gender chosen, all of them in their early to mid-20s. So when I say we're all the same, I mean um, college, college mid early 20 year olds are the same ish mm. around the world mm. um, but from 63 countries or 62 countries around the world the study did find that yes indeed we're more similar in what we remember from the previous day than not we tend to remember actually more likely to remember positive things than we are to remember negative things which was surprising to everyone uh, based on psychology research that suggests that negative things stands out, stand out more in our memory. Uh, it's because they're, <laughs> they're young. What else, what else am I paying a, a psychologist for? To tell you how great my day was? No, I'm going <laughs> to vent. That's why they, they're like, everybody has a very negative experience. No, yeah. no, this is how they talk to you. When they measured the country that is most like the rest of the world, which country do you think it is? Wait, wait. Wait, how can one country be more like the rest of the world? It has to be China. <laughs> On average, or no, India. Whoever's Canada. got the biggest population has oh, got to be Canada? most like the rest of the world. Canada. Canada? Canada. Canada is most like the rest of the world. What does that mean? They Are they in the middle? <laughs> it's because 
Uh, how do I say this without being insulting? I love Canada. I'm not. This isn't trying to be an insult at <laughs> You're all. You're gonna call them boring. Canada is very diverse. It's maybe. just kind of like regular. <laughs> Not inflammatory. It's just regular. it's regular. Our Canadian listeners are hating you right now, Blair. <laughs> no, it means yes, you're great. Canada. It means, it means you're not doing anything wrong. Canada, thanks for being regular. It's great. I wish more no, people were regular. That's gotta, that's gotta be such high praise coming from the United States right that's now. That's what I mean. Being called, you seem normal. Oh, yeah, you know, coming from you, I, exactly. I don't know if I, I, don't know if I want I mean. to be normal. Is that an insult? I'm not really. No, sure. no, no. I'm saying that they, they are more stable than our country. <laughs> it's regular. It's stable. It's consistent. Yeah. It's like things are okay up there. You know? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. As long as you don't look into their treatment of indigenous people, oh, then right, they seem thing. just normal. So just fine and not at all controversial. Fair, yeah. fair point. Fair point. <laughs> the country, well, the, the country that was the country that was yeah. the country that was the most different from other countries was Japan, which surprised me, including the result that Japan people in Japan were one of the um, I guess had the lowest homo homogeneity within their borders their people were least were among the least like their other people wait what really yes 56 oh. out of 62 in terms of homogeneity in oh okay uh, what's I'm, going I'm, on I'm, in no. japan so uh i, I would have expected it would have been like great britain because of of tea time the fact that they have like very specific ritual I, throughout the yeah. day you know i just remember having tea what was that <laughs> So they have a very interesting uh, history, Japan, of sort of having uh, multiple time frames of cultural isolation, and yeah. and uh, yeah. so I can see how I can see how they may have developed, uh, you know, highly unique even amongst but the but the, but the Hamanjan and native within the culture. Huh. Well, you know, you've got you've got people who are working. Uh, fourteen hour days. Actually, I hear that we work more hours though in the United States. The that Netherlands, the Netherlands is the country where it, that's the most homogeneous. Homogeneous. Let's see if I can use words. The Netherlands the, is the most the homogeneous. Mm -hmm. Okay. Everybody has the same bedtime. Mm -hmm. Traffic must be horrible. <laughs> <laughs> everybody's gonna be on the road or because it's yeah. uh homogeneous they're all driving the exact same speed so it's great <laughs> yeah and their cars are all exactly the same so when you come out to the parking lot you're like Ugh. and like everybody else you don't put a single bumper sticker on your car so nobody knows you just hit the button until the alarm goes off and hope nobody else is looking for their car at the same time right the researchers uh the researchers say uh the, the findings hold a lesson worth being mindful of in the current climate of unrest during the COVID-19 pandemic. We can only hope that seeing we're all unified in the challenges we face during these trying times will give people an increased sense of global community. I guess. I don't really feel that connected to most of the country. In, in within this country, let alone other other countries, let alone the state, I feel like different cities you know, have their my, own unique I, I feel happy that the early twenty somethings in the academic community, they're very similar, and they have a nice global community going. That gives me hope for the future. Right. There we right. go. There you go. Blair, tell me about those sharks. Sharks. So, <laughs> sharks. Great way, sharks. Uh, <sighs> They get a bad rap, guys. This is this is um, a study from the University of Sydney, and Australia has its own kind of sordid past with sharks, but I'm going to put that to the side. Ultimately, <laughs> this is a really interesting study looking at the diets of great white sharks, because when we think about great white sharks, we think about them in the deep, deep part of the ocean, and they are coming up from below to feast on marine mammals, and sometimes accidentally humans, but most of the time not. Um, so mostly it's just marine mammals and um, occasionally large fish and stuff like that. 
But so this was a, a nice uh, look at, at the stomachs of 40 juvenile white sharks. So these sharks were, were not too large yet. Um, they were under 2.2 meters in length. So under, what is that, like eight feet or something like that. So um, they can get to be much bigger than that. And when they are bigger, they will eat more things like marine mammals. But as juveniles... Their diet actually was mostly on 32% was on pelagic or midwater ocean swimming fish like salmon. So that was what you would expect it all to be. But instead, 17% of the stomach's contents were bottom dwelling fish. 5% were reef fish and almost 15% were batoid fish like stingrays and bat rays. So that what that means is they're hanging out in the shallows. Yeah, in the shallows, and um, and they're eating off of the seafloor and the mm-hmm. seabed. So this this kind of completely changes how we think great whites eat. So they're not just in the mid the mid ocean right. column. They're mm-hmm. kind of all over the place. They're wherever the food is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So this expectation that great whites only live in in the deepest parts of the ocean, in at least fifty feet deep, not necessarily. Not as, as long the as they're able too. to keep swimming and keep breathing. Yeah. yeah. Fine, so right? this is the other thing I think is interesting is that um, when I worked at an aquarium, one of the things we told people about great white sharks is that they often hunt by sight. <coughs> Excuse me. Because they're dead. Um, So they hunt by sight. So that's why surfers are sometimes chomped is because a surfer on top of a, a surfboard looks a lot like an elephant seal. <laughs> so spins, yeah. Yes. So because they have by sight, this is, this is how this happens. But if they are hunting bottom dwellers that are camouflaged in the sand and buried under the sand, they are not mm-hmm. exclusively hunting by sight. So I would mm. like to see more research on that after this study. Yeah. And also to let more people know that, don't be surprised if those great white sharks are coming into the shallow areas where you're surfing. Yeah, it's and th- really I think not also a questionable thing necessarily. I yeah. think the average person might have a hard time identifying a great white shark, especially since there are other, specifically related to juveniles, there are other shark species that look pretty similar to great white sharks and are not and do not grow large enough to be a threat at all. So um, there's also a whole issue with misidentification but ultimately if they're in the shallows they're probably too young to be a a concern anyway are you are you talking about young i mean baby no don't do it don't do it baby shark (laughs) he you're fired (laughs) you can't fire me i can't (laughs) i'm sorry that's it. <laughs> Pack up your knives and go. That, I don't know. That is the last straw. That is the last straw. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> oh, never mind. <laughs> Have we done it? Do you have any more stories, Justin? Uh, no, I don't. But that's a good point. Maybe the electrical signals are helping them catch the bottom mm-hmm. dwellers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like that comment. Mm-hmm. That's a good one. Uh, Ashish Panza. Yeah, yeah. the Could ampullae be. of Lorenzini. They yes, got their face. amazing sensory ele- organs. Why not? It's got them, yeah. flaunt them. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for listening to this week in science. We have come to the end of another episode. <gasps> yes, we have. If you enjoyed this show, please share it with a friend. That would be really great. I want to give some shout outs right, right, route, route now. Shout out right now to our wonderful helpers, people who help us make this show possible. Fada, thank you for your help on social media and show descriptions. Gord, thank you for manning the chat room. Identity4, thank you for recording the show so that we have files of audio. It's amazing. And thank you to the Burroughs Welcome Fund and our Patreon sponsors for their generous support. Thank you, too. 
Paul Disney, Andrew Swanson, Stu Pollock, Ed Dyer, Ken Hayes, Kosti Ranke, Craig Landon, Tony Steele, Alex Wilson, Steve DeBell, Joshua Fury, Philip Shane, Ed Love Science, Mark Mazaros, Mar- Richard Porter, Sky Luke, Brian Condren, Richard, Ed- Eric Knapp, Jason Roberts, Matthew Litwin, Jack, Bob Calder, Guillaume. Dave Neighbor, E.O., Kevin Parachan, Matt Sutter, Aaron Luthen, Christopher Rappin, Brendan Minish, Greg Briggs, Robert, Gary S., Marjorie, Rudy Garcia, Kurt Larson, Steve Leisman, Sean Lamb, Greg Riley, Jim Drapeau, Lisa Suzuki, Christopher Dreyer, Brian Carrington, Jason Olds, John McKee, Paul, Artyom, Ulysses Adkins, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Dave Wilkinson, Sue Doster, Paul Ronovich, Gerald Myshak, Dave Friedel, John Ratnaswamy, Stephen Alberon, South of Gradney, Mountain Sloth, Rodney Lewis, Sarah Chavez, Corinne Benton, John Gridley, Jean Tellier, Patrick Pecoraro, Darwin Hannon, Matt Bass, Dan. K, Sarah Forfar, Donald Munnis, Howard Tan, Josiah Zayner, Taylor P.S., Ben Bignell, Maddie Perrin, Mark Hessenflow, John Atwood, Ali Coffin, Ben Rothig, John Lee, and Flying Out. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. We can't do it without you. If you're interested in supporting us on Patreon, find information at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. On next week's show... We will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time, broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels, as well as from twist.org uh, backslash forward slash. I can't tell the difference. Try them both live. Uh, are you sick of looking at us? Want to listen to us as a podcast? <laughs> <laughs> Just search for This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well for more information on anything you've heard here today show notes and links to stories will be available on our website www.twist.org and you can also sign up for our newsletter hey contact us directly email kirsten and kirsten at thisweekinsights.com justin at twistminion at gmail.com or blair at blair baz at twist.org hey that was me just put, just put twist t-w-i-s in the subject line or we're never gonna read it because it'll get spam filtered <laughs> into oblivion oblivion yes. <laughs> but that but 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 don't give up if that happens you can still hit us up on the twitter where we are at twist science at dr key at jackson fly that's me and at blair's menagerie that's blair we love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, haiku that comes to you tonight, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. <laughs> this Week in Science. This Week in Science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way So everybody listen to what I say I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's This Week in Science This Week in Science This Week in Science Science Science, science. science. This Week in Science This Week in Science this week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy, jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Gandhi Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science 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 Science. This week in science This week in science This week in science 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 Got a long-
laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. This week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. This week in science, 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 this week in science. Hey Blair. Hey Blair. Yes. Hey Blair. Yes. Yes. Um, somebody emailed me on Patreon mm -hmm. and wanted to know mm -hmm. Is our newsletter real? <laughs> what? <laughs> I think it's time for us to do a newsletter. Oh no. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's been too long. <laughs> it's been a couple of months. Okay. We can do that. Are you feeling overwhelmed? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we should get Justin to write something. Yeah. I will I assemble mean, something. It's I think it's the writing. Just the and writing. And the, yeah. Okay. So, I can assemble yeah. a newsletter in like half an hour. Okay. All right. Great. Okay. See, the assembly is where I'm like, I don't want to oh, yeah. bother. Let me I can write definitely something. do that. Yeah. I, yeah. Something. I'm just, I can't. You can't I sent, think of extra things right now. I, I emailed mm -hmm. 90 people today, and I have to email another 310 in the next two days. That's a lot of email. <sighs> that is a lot I'm, of email. Yes. I'm, I'm a little, my brain is dead. <laughs> Don't have a dead brain. We just need yeah. to give it rest so okay. that. Just like the artificial brains. Yeah, I need rest. <laughs> you need rest. Rest, relaxation. Mm -hmm. Ooh, maybe a fire pit. You should have a fire pit. That sounds fun. I know, I like fire pits. I miss my jacuzzi. Ooh, I want a jacuzzi. I have one right outside my door, but it's closed. <laughs> Actually, I don't like jacuzzis. Never mind. <laughs> I don't like the hot tubs. I like pools. I like pools on hot days. I like both. Mm -hmm. I like cold weather. <laughs> yeah, how warm yeah. is it? I like cold weather. How are you doing I, there I in California? I want to equivocate. I do not like warm weather. I've decided it's not for me. You've lived in California in the land of the warm weather for pretty much your whole life, yes? Uh, yeah, I, I did a, a, a nice couple of long stints, uh, still in California, but in the tropical rainforests of Humboldt County, where oh, right. that's different. Yeah. 200 something days out of the year. And mm -hmm. I felt so comfortable. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Davis, California in the summer is uh, it's, it's not nice. No, <laughs> it's not nice. Central no, Valley is just becomes awful. <laughs> it makes you like going to work where it's air conditioned. Yeah. Well, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, unless you also, on top of that, had the job I had for most of my working career, which was outdoors. Right. Yes. So, on yeah. A, so yeah, I made bad choices. I admit it. Um, <laughs> speaking of being outdoors... <laughs> Uh, I got a sunburn from standing outside for an hour yesterday, um, on my forearm, an area that's usually like very, very tan. <laughs> um, and, uh, I even put on sunscreen beforehand 
but I got a sunburn because I'm a, I'm a mole person now after shelter in place. <laughs> Hello, mole person. Yes. Don't be a mole person. Wear sunblock. Wear, I did. I still got a sunburn. You must wear what I wear. It's called Irish Strength Sunblock. <laughs> Is that SPF 2000 or what? Yes. <laughs> Yes, it's actually, it's the luck of the Irish. <laughs> it's just, you slap it on, it's a bunch of good luck. That's it. <laughs> you just have to hope that you don't get burned. Uh, H-N-E-K and Gorov in our YouTube chat room is saying, maybe we should, we can highlight research focused on minorities once a month moving forward. Hmm. I think that's a fantastic idea. We can even we can focus on it in the newsletter, or um, you know, if there is anything specific, make sure that we've got a, a specific segment on the show. Yeah, uh, I talked a while back about um, uh, police violence and uh, life expectancy, how it affects this sort of thing amongst uh, male, female of different racial groups a while back. It's a study I've heard cited quite a bit lately. And one of the one of the interesting things about the study is it was pulled from news reports. And the reason it was pulled from news reports is because police departments apparently do not keep records of uh, their homicides. They don't they don't uh, record uh, the race of someone who they shot or lynched, um, and and it's amazing to me because if you become incarcerated, they take your blood, they run your fingerprints, they sequence your DNA, they have, take photographs of your tattoos, they record your height, your weight, uh, they take photographs of your face, they do all of this. Uh, but if they kill you, it's a lot less paperwork, apparently. <laughs> oh, geez. So, so they had to, well, no, and this is a problem, you know, and it's that also, it's also, there've been fights against the CDC, uh, just taking gun violence Keeping. data in general. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know about that. And, and so it's difficult to, uh, do studies, uh, based on a lack of information. So there are things that need to change. Hopefully, hopefully we will, uh, hopefully we are at a point where. You know, there's a, there's a little bit of a, the, the purge that's taking place as peaceful protests uh, are being crashed by violent police protests and riots. Um, there are, you know, we're seeing every couple of days, like the police here, police officers there getting arrested or fired uh, for what's being caught on camera. And so uh, based on this, I think that whole that whole concept of the few bad, bad apples has yeah. just been refuted en masse by police forces across this country. That there is something systematically so, wrong so with the way that they are trained. The thing, and the thing that was repeated. Yeah, the thing that was repeated over and over and over, like one day, because I think there was one police police chief who used the bad apples analogy in a in a press oh, conference recently, on yeah, social media my off. like i think my entire twitter feed was scientists individually saying hey so science can help you out with this apples produce um what is it ethylene ethylene glycol which uh makes the rest of the apples go bad so yes. if you have one rotting apple it produces yeah. produces a molecule that makes the whole barrel go bad so yeah. if you do have one bad apple the whole bunch throw it all out and so, and so something else I'll point out when, when we have gotten this video of, of police crimes uh, in the numbers that we've gotten, and, and we can go back, you know, I, I, uh, this has been, has it been 20 years of capturing stuff on video with cell phones now? Mm -hmm. um, one, there is one pattern. Much more so now, though. But yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I was I was thinking about we talked about this before uh, on a previous show that I was doing with uh, Pam. Uh, 
mm -hmm. Panorama called Meaningless Words, we did an, uh, an episode where we read out names of uh, unarmed black men who were killed by police. And it was a lengthy list. And I haven't done that show 10 years probably a much okay. longer and we had a lot we had a an inexhaustible because we just i mean you know uh at some point um one of the things that's an interesting uh thread through all of those is there's always a little bit of a delay in the past uh between the police filing their report on the incident and the video coming out now that time frame is changing some of this stuff is coming out live now uh but the thread through it all is the police officers lie in the filing of their report. They change the circumstance. They change the sequence of events. They add uh, aggressive actions by the other party. They claim a de-escalation that doesn't take place. Uh, you know, they, these, are, these are consistent uh bad behaviors at without repercussion is the other thread that you also see through all of this so um there is a call right now to have a national nationwide accountability standard for policing uh a transparency of record of complaints against officers you know there is a, one actually one of my Favorite. That's what I mean. Transparency of, of records is the most important things. I mean, that's why so many yes. science, scientific researchers are moving towards open data and um, open lab notebooks even. So creating rep repositories that are online that anyone can access after a paper is published to be able to go back and check whether things are correct so that you can always double check. And so it's it's just part of the process. Transparency is essential. And there's, there's another thread in this also that is sort of like uh, counterintuitive to towards me. But uh, the people who are very much uh, uh, backing police uh, culture and activities continuing as they are tend to be people who politically are anti-union. But the strength of the police is ability to leverage their their will against the budgets of cities have very high pay have very good is because they have because the strongest the union in the country mm -hmm. so the yeah. people who are against unions also think the strongest union in the country is a great thing and shouldn't be dealt with well there's of, also people that are against uh federal government having a bunch of authority and then wanted the federal government to go police the protests so there's lots of kind of uh that's the same group contradiction uh, yeah exactly the, the that yeah. that contingent has a mm -hmm. lot of contradictory you know it's it's what serves it's in the moment it's called hypocrisy yes yeah they're absolutely but self-serving but, but the other thing is like remember when remember when the la police uh uh decided to stop policing neighborhoods because they were in some conflict over funding or whatever the situation was in New York. Those neighborhoods that they stopped policing didn't have an outbreak of crime. Um, they, they started intentionally under policing areas to show a lesson. Uh, they started having a, a what it was, it's a, what do you call it, blue out or whatever when they just were, everybody was sick. Blue flu, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody was called in all their sick leave at once and they tried to under police. Uh, areas of Manhattan and crime was down. The calls didn't come in. Um, the you know the. Well, it'll be interesting okay. to see what happens in uh, in Minneapolis because you know yeah. that'll really be the that's going to be the it, test where they're they're starting from the ground up fresh. And this yeah. has happened it'll other places. Uh, was it Camden? New Jersey, yeah, Camden, yeah. 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 The, Camden, yeah. And but that's one of my not even favorite, the only one. There are more, but yeah, yeah. They're my but Minneapolis is like a big city. It's it's going to be interesting to see. One of my favorite proposals was uh, removing police from uh, uh, dealing with mental health and homelessness because it is it is the wrong. It's the wrong. Uh, you know, you you could act. There was there was you know there's you can if you Google it. Uh, you know, uh, mentally ill uh, police uh, shooting. 
just those words, you will find all these instances of police yeah. showing up to somebody who's mentally ill and ending up shooting them because they yep. were you know, ill-equipped to deal with it. Yep. Um, we could have multiple community departments within. You can still sure. have... I, I'd still I would have, love to see it. Yeah. You can still have the highway patrol doing, you know, uh, vehicle monitoring stuff. Yeah. You can still have uh, police investigating the what are considered serious crimes, which, by the way, the percentage of arrests that are considered really serious crimes in this country, any guess? It's about 5% of mm -hmm. the arrests uh, are considered serious crimes. So we have a we have the, a larger prison population than China for not for not in a serious country in the world. Yeah, well, it's good. I mean that has there's there's a whole systemic yeah. you know the prison industrial complex and yep. who's making money and mm -hmm. there's a whole you know this is this yeah is, and it's not just the prisons it's the people who are using but, the prisoners for labor. Yeah, it's a whole yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. but so this the whole thing needs to get broken. Uh, mm -hmm. On one hand, and the other part is that yeah, police mm -hmm. are not judges. And also, by the way, I blame judges because with all the police abuse that we're seeing, you're going to tell me that no judge had any idea that police were using these tactics, that police were being violent towards, that they heard the same I thing from her. witness after witness saying, uh, or from from defense attorney after defense attorney. Okay, your honor, but the police beat up my client before they took him to jail. They did this to my client. Well. They must have had a good reason or whatever. The ju judges have been alibying the bad behavior. Prosecutors have been looking at the other way at the bad behavior of the police. So the police have also a strong union that supports who gets to be elected mayor. They, they stand behind the, you know, mm -hmm. them. They need to end that. They need to stop allowing police to endorse anyone. That would be that's a big one because you can't the politics of the whole system. You yeah, gotta remove it's, the it's, police yeah. from the politics. You can't have them endorsing so, candidates. Um, so mm. John Oliver, somebody brought him up recently. Um, he so did an good. amazing show on police this past weekend, but months ago he did a show on sheriffs and the fact that sheriffs are actually elected. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting that you have this, what is supposed to be a public service situation. You have police, but then you have this elected official who's in charge and they often run unopposed. And then they can endorse. So then they also get supported by political systems or political parties yeah. because their endorsement is key to somebody else's victory. Right. I like Anna and An An Anaki's idea of RoboCops. Yeah, we're just going to let Boston Dynamic put all of mm -hmm. those robotic dogs on every corner. Yeah. <laughs> except except when we when we used artificial Jaywalking intelligence analysis. Is illegal. When you, we used Bark. neighborhood and zip code data, we've uh, we've uh, immediately it immediately turns into over incarceration for minorities. Right. The idea of impartiality mm -hmm. where you use somebody's zip code to judge them leads to a vicious cycle of incarceration. So that doesn't work. You, the AI can't be applied here. What actually could be applied, just one suggestion, is spend that budget on education and schooling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and education. And Mental health. Amazing. Yeah. Mental health. And, and education. And housing and the education. homeless. Yeah. No, not just housing the homeless. Housing the poor so they're not renting. I mean, housing the rent is the mass of this country. Um, if somebody doesn't own their home, they don't have uh, a, a, stability. A, they don't have any kind of stability, and and the fact that we have a landlord class society at this point that is getting getting it's larger. Only the, expanding. It's, it's expanding. only expanding. Yeah. The, what the are you talking about? Being, Only 60% yeah. of my paycheck goes to rent. I know. Yeah. But the way and the, what's <laughs> happening is there's more money going into the hands of the, the landowners. Yep. They're buying buying up which more is, properties. Which is why people left yeah. their countries to come to America. Because they couldn't <laughs> own a piece of where they came yeah. from. That's, yeah. Seriously, that's why we left. We got yeah. off the king's land because we couldn't own it. Or they, when I say we, I mean the original uh, American Slave oh. owners. Oh, yeah. see now. Oh. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who it's also protested against the British, and they they were heroes. So, yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, Fada, no, I saw no. your question. I will. I'll, I'll get back to you about that. 
Yes. That sounds interesting. Yeah. I don't know. Football. I mean, it's good to talk about this stuff. It's good for people to, if you haven't been exposed to these ideas, um, to think about them a bit and to look look into them more because um, it's only going to get worse unless we do something, unless people do something. And it's not waiting for the the people in charge to do something because no. that's the, that's been the problem. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, so it, the, it, it, the yeah. change is only going to come from the grassroots up and it uh and it's going to involve people educating themselves and uh and looking into this stuff and don't believe it can't happen here you may be the biggest karen in the world and think that this doesn't affect you if mm -hmm. you uh the beginnings of a police state is always going to be attacking uh, the weakest and most vulnerable in your society first. But they don't stop there. They don't yeah. stop there. Mm -mm. Yep, yep. Remember, remember, <laughs> Antifa is a terrorist organization now. It's not despite real. Having, <laughs> despite having not killed anybody, but it stands for anti-fascism. Yes. If you True. think Antifa is bad, Wait till you see the actual fascists and what they have in store for you. That's all. Yeah, scientists great. won't even be able to science, man. They'll only be able to science what the state allows them to yes. science. And then it'll be propaganda and, anyway. Yeah, they'll only be able to publish what proves that they want them to prove. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Definitely. Yeah. Yes, which is what not we great. Which is what we try not to support. We Our fearless leader made an unsubstantiatable interests. claim. And mm -hmm. this week, scientists substantiated it. Hurrah! That's what the future will be. No. Oh. Good. <laughs> Even with that, with that fun oldie time radio voice, it's still if, not a good future. So I think if that also, ever happens, I think if it, as it slides to propagandic science, if it does that, that I can't. I won't be able to report science anymore. I won't be able to no. have these conversations. No. This it won't, won't be science fun. anymore. It, it won't, won't be, be science, science anymore. We'll that, have to have ooh, we'll have to have an underground an underground podcast. Yeah. That talks about we science. Are, that we people, already basically are doing in their garage. Yes. And just plans. This is just yeah, forever. So, and we'll be this the science underground. I feel like it's important to to say too like while while we're sitting here complaining about all this stuff um that like if if you are out there and you're also upset about these things. There's there's lots of things that you can do. And clearly the protests are something that's really visible and really um, creating a common uh, dialogue, which is the first step to something, hopefully, really big. Um, but if you're not a person that can do that, if you're immunocompromised and you don't want to go out there right now because COVID's still lingering around, or if, you know, you get anxiety in crowds, or you're still working full time, two jobs to support your family or whatever it is, there's other stuff that you can do. And, you know, we shared some really cool stuff last week. Kiki's Eight Can't Wait is is a great place to start. It gives you a way to find out what is allowed and not allowed by police in your area and, and gives you numbers of people to call or email to try to demand change. But there, you can just Google it and there's lots of amazing resources of different ways that you can be a part of positive change in your community. So. Yeah. Self-education. Yeah. What, what? It goes way back. It goes back. Mm -hmm. History, everyone. This is hundreds of years of history that we're talking yeah. about. And it somehow keeps repeating itself. So maybe we can try to break the cycle here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We are more connected yeah. than we have ever been. So. There could be protests several states over, and you might not find out about it until two weeks later, if ever, because your newspaper might be owned by somebody that didn't want to tell you about it but we now have the internet and we can know exactly what's going on all over our country and our world and and yeah we're more connected than ever this is a great time to break the cycle okay uh also if you're like me uh, uh who has been through several <laughs> rounds of peaceful uh, nonviolent protesting training uh but know that you are going to throw the tear gas back 
that uh, that know that if somebody swings a baton at you, you are going to defend yourself. Maybe don't go. If you know if you know you have a threshold that's going to prevent you, or or are going to be provocatively confrontational, don't go. Yeah. Stay home. Yeah, I mean, especially especially if you're white, because then you are escalating tension, and the people who are more likely to get injured are not you. So, like, that is another thing to keep in mind as well. Uh, yeah, if it's if it's organized by uh, 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 Black Lives Matter or something, then yeah, and if you feel like being violent, then don't. However, if you're in your all white, lily white town and uh, a cop swings a baton at you, it's fair game. <laughs> yeah. Like, no, I don't. I'm, I'm actually saying this sarcastically. I don't skills. necessarily uh, right. sarcasm condone violence in any form ever, which is why I do avoid these things because I, 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 as much as I've done the training and I know what I'm supposed to do, it's not my reaction. Um, mm -hmm. So I steer clear. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's Knowing smart. and doing are two different things. So know yourself so that know you can do you... the best thing <laughs> for the situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it is also, you know, this is, this is, it's, it's really scary when police are rioting because they're showing up with weapons, uh, they're and, swinging batons. They brought chemical armor. weapons. They're <laughs> shooting people in the head with with uh, yeah. with bullet rubber bullets that are blinding people, maiming people, killing people. I mean, this is this is exactly why the people started the protests. Um, and it's continuing, mm -hmm. yeah, it continues yeah. the cycle of violence and and uprising. Yeah, um, yeah, it's not helping. It doesn't help. Yeah, and we have a president who thinks that Kent State was a great idea, apparently. So, yeah. Anyways. And we, we, we had have a president who built a wall around himself. Oh, so yeah. That he was, got that his was wall. That's his, yeah, that's his answer to everything. I still He's am so basement, mad in the that we had a bunch of armed white protesters angry about shelter in place. And the cops didn't show up to that protest armed to the teeth. I'm still very frustrated by that. It's just the stark contrast within one week. Mm -hmm. Oh, it hasn't got, it hasn't been lost on people. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a very stark oh, contrast. Oh, well, you know, you could also look at the uh, women's uh, march. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the tear gas. Mm -mm. Nope. Nope. The science march. Mm-hmm. The March for, yeah, the March for Science a couple of years back. Yeah. No tear gas. No tear gas. Lots of people marching for science. Yep. March against <laughs> police violence. <laughs> they're going to teach you a lesson. It, it, I, mean, it, I mean, it looks like they're trying to put down the population, like aggressively intimidate and, uh, and do violence to our fellow citizens for protesting them the police violence that they're seeing increasing around them so uh i love i love the uh the trend that's taking place with uh and it's unfortunate that it takes this uh this sorts of scenarios for this to happen but i like the trend toward that people are thinking about rethinking policing it's uh i, I want to i want to uh, every police officer to be safe and I want to be able to be proud of my local law enforcement. We had, uh, we had in the city of Davis, we had a young female police officer that was murdered. I don't know if I talked about this last week on the show. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. uh, and my daughter, my youngest daughter is very conflicted. She's seven. She's trying to like, so we've been to a memorial for a police officer who was killed by, by some lunatic. And we are now uh, at a memorial for uh, somebody who was killed by a police officer lunatic. You know, um, there there needs to be the excuse I keep hearing uh, from law enforcement entities is a, is about the the fallen officers and about the losses and the violence there. The answer to the the violence that they have encountered that police and law enforcement encounters is not to enact a magnitude of violence against all of the rest of the citizens. You're magnifying the problem. You're not reducing it. 
So something needs to absolutely train, uh, change in their training and the way that they treat the public and the way they react to the public because they're increasing the problem, not diffusing it. Uh, it may be that time, Blair. Yeah, Kiki got kicked out twice in a row. <laughs> I know. Okay, I got to go. All right. Uh, well, on that note, everybody, keep keep learning, reading, watching, listening, speaking, sharing. And we'll be here next week sharing science. Say goodnight, Blair. Oh, wait, she's still not back. You, you don't want to wait for her to say goodnight? She's almost here. Hold on. She's just waving and looking frustrated. Good night, Blair. Say good night, Justin. Good night, Justin. Good night. I, I can't hear you. So bye. Oh, you can hear me? I can't hear you at all. A little bit. Awesome. Bye, everybody. Thanks for watching. I need to fix my computer. I always fix the computer. Bye. Thanks for watching, Twist. We'll see you next week.